traditional English law has granted men the right to control their wives. A woman and a man would marry, and through marriage, they would become one entity. They would now possess one legal identity. The man, the husband, is legally responsible for the upkeep, the maintenance of his wife. So if a woman was injured and seeks to sue the responsible party, she could not do so without her husband's approval. What this also meant is that a woman could not be sued unless her husband was included as a defendant. The man is now responsible for his wife's actions to offset this liability. What we provided men was with the authority to control the actions of his wife. Well, in essence, what this meant is that a man could physically reprimand his wife. What a man could also do was restrain his wife's movements. What the law was doing was sanctioning the subordination of women. So a woman is now legally inferior to a man. And because you had the sanctioning of correction, you essentially were sanctioning, condoning violence against women. Now in the 19th century, domestic violence was regarded primarily as a class issue. So social reform at the time was about improving the material conditions of workers. Was it effective? Not really. Domestic violence is not a class issue. Rather, it was born of the inferior status that women had, both legally and socially. So in the 20th and in the 21st century, though in the last few years, domestic violence is represented primarily as a personal problem. So to address violence, there's been an increase in policing powers, and they can now detain and even arrest someone. And this does happen to a far greater extent than it did historically. The go government has also increased the number of instances in which it prosecutes individuals for domestic violence. And we see that even sentences for domestic violence have gone up. These reforms, however, have not in fact resolved the problem. So the law and order approach works when the act is reported to the police. But as we know, this is a familial situation. There is a reluctance to bring the police into the mix. Why is there this reluctance? So you have this instance, or even many instances, but ultimately, we still want to preserve this relationship. And we know that bringing in the police is going to harm that. So we can think of this psychological element. On one hand, there can be the element of fear, but then there's also the psychological element, another part to it. So it's not just the fear, but the sense that this is part of the relationship. The point is that because it's a familial relationship, it becomes somewhat thorny. It's a little more complex. So how we deal with a situation involving violence with a loved one is very different from how we deal with it when it's involving a stranger. So the law and order approach only works if there is a willingness to report the incident to the police and the willingness to see this through the court system. Sometimes the reason that women do not turn to the system is because they've turned to the system before and the system has failed them. Sometimes what these victims, some refer to them as survivors of domestic violence do, is take the law into their own hands and kill their spouse. Now when they're prosecuted for murder, what these women argue is self-defense. So self-defense we have to look at what a reasonable person believes. And then there are two elements to self-defense. One is there has to be an immediate risk of bodily harm, severe bodily harm. What there also has to be 
is the necessity to use deadly force. Now, self-defense is legally problematic for women who are defending themselves <coughs> in instances of domestic violence. Women rarely do it face to face. They usually do it when the spouse is asleep. So this is, for many women, a reality that the only time they feel safe is when the spouse is asleep or passed out. The person's asleep or passed out. They do not pose an immediate risk. Deadly force is certainly not necessary. Why? Because you can just walk out of the house. You can call the police. At least, that is what a reasonable person would do. A number of feminist legal theorists have said is that the mindset of a woman who suffers this level of domestic violence is very different from the mindset of someone who does not. So the reasonable person standard doesn't in fact apply because the mindset is different. So then what you need is a different standard. So what feminist legal theorists have pointed to, they said that the standard you need to apply in this situation is the one of a woman who has suffered domestic abuse for X amount of time. Battered women's defenses rarely lead to acquittals. They're usually treated as a partial defense, and usually what you're trying to do is to reduce the sentencing following conviction or how juries have treated the situation as a form of provocation. So as to reduce the conviction or the charge from murder to manslaughter. If you look at murder, murder requires deliberation, it requires premeditation, and in this instance what you have is deliberation, premeditation, and then you have the act. But it doesn't count as murder. So in the end, what you're doing is dealing with the problem after the fact. You've already got the battered woman, and you've already got the dead husband. So you're not in any way addressing domestic violence. All you're doing is cleaning up the mess. There has been a push by the New Zealand Law Commission and what they've proposed is a self-preservation defense. So if this person is suffering under continuing sexual or physical violence, and they see no future and no possibility of protection from that violence, from that abuse, and they are convinced that they're going to have to live under this, then that would amount to a partial defense if they end up killing their spouse. Self-preservation defense is just right, a revision of battered women's defense. It's trying to address some of the shortcomings of battered women's defense. But it is still not addressing the problem itself. What does this say about due process? What does this say about equality before the law? What does this say about a standard burden of proof and a standard mindset, so reasonable person, and how we deal with a particular situation? We're changing it, and we're saying that what matters here is not just how a reasonable person would act, but rather how that person felt in that situation. It brings in an element of subjectivity that the law is meant to neutralize. Do not agree just for the sake of trying to earn some browning points. Instead, use this opportunity to learn, to decide for yourself what type of person you are, what it is that you believe in, what it is that you want to struggle and fight for.